Hi, welcome to the first lecture in um, Soccer 1050. I'm Steve Threadgold. I'll be um, taking the weeks that are on youth in the course. Um, so in this um, first part of the first video, uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a really brief introduction to the course, not just more of the context of the course, uh, mostly because you'll be going over that in shoots. Um, and then I'll be taking you through an introduction to youth, what is youth and why it's an important thing to be studying. So this is a pretty new course, it's the second, it, it's kind of only been running for a few years um, and it's been designed to bring together some research strengths in the school and to have um, students be able to kind of get exposed to that I suppose. So there's um, uh, the U Newcastle Youth Studies group that um, involves myself and Julia Coffey and David Ferruja and Pam Nylon. Um, there's the new criminology degree that um, uh, that Xanthi Mallet is, is uh, running. So um, there's also a strong research culture in sociology in Newcastle about the sociology of health. So this course is trying to bring those together. Um, it is framed around young people, so I'll be doing four weeks on youth, Xanthi will be doing four weeks on crime and Julia's four weeks on health, but they'll also be framed around youth and young people's issues and youth research. So you'll go through all the assessment and stuff like that in, um, in tutes. So this lecture is going to go through those things. I'm, I'm going to break it up into three different parts. I'm going to kind of outline what youth studies is as a field. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about adulthood and some theories around what um, the elongation of youth means and talk a little bit about youth cultures. So here's part one. So part... Uh, what I want to begin with is just talking a little bit around this very idea of what youth is. Um, so it's important to think of the very notion of youth as a social construction. Um, just like adolescence you know, it was discovered by psychologists in like the 20th century, youth is used in a particular way to analyse um, aspects of society in the ways that we move from child to adult. So in many ways it's used to do really ideological, specific ideological work, particularly in the media and politics. Um, there's constant representations of young people in the media around moral panics, around deviance and drugs and you know driving cars too fast and all this kind of stuff tend to be about taking risks. Young people are constantly scapegoated um, and blamed for things that aren't really their own fault. They tend to be symptoms of wider economic and social problems. And there's particular kind of relationships between what we call generations um, that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail throughout. So in this sense, we can think of, you know, very broadly here, youth is just a word. Um, you know, it means so many different things that it's kind of difficult to, um, to situate all young people in the same category um, because, you know, they're very different in terms of class, race, gender, you know, different countries, different religions and all that kind of thing. But youth itself is used um, in youth studies to think about this kind of period between what we define as being a child and adult. There's this like transitional period in the middle. Um, and it kind of shows us how these kind of relations of power that are related through age. So youth studies is generated as a field in that time. Um, and it's really kind of grown to be a really strong uh, part of what sociology is today. So we can think here in terms of um, how there's like an ever-growing amount of uh, conferences around the world around youth studies. There's specific journals um, called the Journal of Youth Studies that myself and Dave Farouja and other uh, Newcastle sociologists are editors of. Um, and um, it's again meant to kind of be a very broad understanding of the lives of young people. Uh, it's, it's also been um, really important, I think, youth studies in, in kind of uncovering what are the kind of new risks that people face. Young people tend to be at the vanguard of social change. They're the ones that kind of tend to be facing the, the most kind of pointy um, problems from it. Um, and so youth studies is often a kind of point to the future in many ways. It can get us to help us to understand, um, you know, social change in particular. So youth studies has developed as a field um, quite rapidly, particularly since the, the 90s, and I'll go into some reasons of that, but it does leave a lot of things out, um, and particularly the global south is still particularly under, underrepresented um, in youth studies. 
it's largely been associated, you know, since the rise of what's been known as, known as the Birmingham School, it's kind of key subcultural studies that um, you got some of you guys that would have done Soccer 101 would have seen, um, around how rather than seeing youth in that kind of moral panicky way of being a threat to society or being vapid or being, um, you know, false conscious dupes or whatever, uh, there was this ethnographic research that... Um, started to show that maybe some of young people's popular cultural practices and youth cultural practices were, were possibly a site of resistance from dominant norms and hear things like punk and, and goth and the mods and rockers and stuff like that started to be seen as a site of um, not really just consumption but also maybe production, um, producing various forms of, of identity and resistance. Um, since the 80s and 90s, there's been a kind of development of what we've called youth transitions and this is the field of study that looks at the, the ways that, you know, young people move from being a child to adult, from, you know, going to school to getting a job, from being single to having a partner and to living at home with a family, if they're lucky enough to have that, to be able to get a place of their own. So much of this work in, um, in the field of youth transitions has highlighted how um, that period of being a child of transitioning from being a child to an adult is elongating. Many of those markers of adulthood, of you know, getting a full-time job, getting married, having kids, having your own house, having much, uh, happening much later in life. So within that, there's been a kind of key interest in how inequalities um, affect that transition. There's also been a rise in, um, in, new, in new studies as well that look at things like space and time and effect and labour. So there's been a, a real broadening of the field in, in recent years. So a key text here has been um, Wynne and White's classic Rethinking Youth and also Furlong and Carmel's Young People and Social Change that there'll be um, readings for those uh, in the course guide. So in these kind of classic texts now that, that were um, published in the 90s, um, they argue that you know, while there's a group of people that we can maybe call youth that share a similar age bracket, and the official age bracket has been you know, 15 to 25, as kind of defined by Centrelink um, and institutions like that. So there's certainly a common age bracket that people share, but it's really difficult to think about that um, group as a common group, a coherent group that kind of all experience the same things. They may experience the same economic, social and political conditions, but they experience it in very different ways based on um, you know, where they grow up, who their parents are, whether they're male or female or black or white and all these other kind of key sociological contours of inequality. So it's important to think here youth as a relational um, concept. Youth gets us to kind of get an understanding of how power works between groups um, and how institutions uh, relate to people of a particular age as well. What Rethinking Youth also asked us to do was reconsider the kind of dominant tropes of, um, of the way youth is represented in mainstream society, particularly the kind of psychological um, notion of youth being this kind of thing in development from being risky to secure and all these kind of things. Um, what, what we get an understanding of here is that there's a kind of demand on young people to you know, be good citizens and develop good morals and all this kind of stuff and that they mature after a certain time. But um, I think if you look a little bit more widely, you might kind of look around and see a lot of you know, immature and irresponsible adults. So it seems here that you know, youth is often scapegoated in moral panics again for these kind of um, large scale social problems. They're seen as lazy, irresponsible, you know, not trying hard enough to get the right jobs or whatever. Um, and what much youth study shows is that um, these stereotypes of young people are really individualisation. They individualise um, wider social problems. They start blaming the individual rather than thinking about the economic, economic and social costs of that. So that's um, the, the first part of what I want to consider here, that youth has been a key object of study in sociology over the past few decades, that, um, that in particular this field has, has kind of risen around um, dominant kind of media and political uses of young people and kind of started to try and um, do something about that, try and, you know, um, hopefully get a more realistic picture of what it means to be a young person rather than the kind of 
you know, overtly positive one of the kind of high achieving student or the negative kind of version that appears in moral panics. Um, we think a little bit here about how young, young people are, are used as scapegoats and also how generations are kind of set up as kind of opposed to each other. Um, particularly you'll kind of see moral panics all the time. It tends to be kind of older people reflecting on young people, how they just don't seem to get it, they don't do it right and back in my day things were better. Okay, that's the end of part one.